Good morning, HCC. There's some honking. Oh, there's some honking. All right. Welcome to Drive-In Church. Hope you're ready to endure the rain. We're <laughs> hiding inside for right now, um, and we're going to try to do a few tunes. So, Just in case you forgot what the, uh, the sanctuary looks like, you can check it out on the live stream. <laughs> right, you're right. Today's a little different. We, we've had a few technical difficulties this morning, and it's raining, and we're not up on the lift, and, you know, we, we, we recognize the, the realities and the limitations of 
drive in church. Uh, the reality, though, too, is that uh, where two or three are gathered in the name of Christ, he is there. And that is the most important thing. So whether you are here present in the parking lot today or whether you are at home uh, tuning in on the live stream, we are gathered in the name of Christ and he is here with us. Listen to the words from Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not, even the darkness will not be dark to you, for night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious are your thoughts, O Lord. How vast is the sum of them. Where I could count them, they would number the grains of sand when I awake, I am still with you. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. We come to worship our Lord this morning, the one who has made the heavens and the earth, the, ones who ha the one who has formed each one of us, unique in our own capacity, the one who has written all of the days of, of our lives in his book, the one who never slumbers or sleeps, the one who will never leave us and never forsake us. He meets us here today, wherever here is for you. And he greets us with these words, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. We're going to continue worship this morning. On a hill far away, on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and I love that old cross where the deer is standing. Oh uh -huh. 
Blessed be your glorious name. You give life. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath, it's your breath. Even in the midst of this time of struggles and trials, 
you continue to sustain us. You continue to walk with us. You have not left us. And so, Lord, today we say, blessed be your name. On a road that is marked with struggles and trials, in a time that feels like a desert, Lord. I'm reminded of the story in Ezekiel where he is looking at a valley full of dry bones. And you say, can these bones live? You say, prophesy, Lord, to those bones, Ezekiel. Lord, we feel in many ways like that valley of dry bones. Our world has been turned upside down. Our lives are are different than they used to be. And so, Lord, today as we turn to your word, we pray that you would revive us. Lord, that you would raise us up. That you, Lord, would put, put us back together again. So that we can truly say in this time that you give, you take away, but in the midst of it all, Lord, blessed be your name. Give us life. Fill our lungs, fill us with your strength, your peace once again. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, hey, good morning again. Welcome to Hopkins Community Church. Uh, We are opening God's Word today to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, I encourage you to do that, to, to open your Bibles if you have them. See that the words are there. Don't listen, don't listen to my voice this morning. Listen to the words of Scripture and what God is saying to you through them today. 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to read verses 1 to 11, uh, and we're going to focus in on, on two verses, but I always... I, I I hate to cherry pick scripture. I hate to just read a single verse. And so we're going to set this verse in it, the two verses, verses six and seven, in its context of the the sort of closing statements of Peter in his first letter to the churches. First Peter chapter five, verses one through 11. Listen to the word of the Lord today. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder And as a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in his glory to be revealed, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when and, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud and give, shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, the hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. I want to reread 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. I'm going to read it again in the NIV, and I want to read it in a, a, in a paraphrase transition. It's the Phillips paraphrase. So listen to these words too. He says again, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Or the Phillips translation. So humble yourselves under God's strong hand and in his own good time, he will lift you up. You can throw the whole weight of your anxieties upon him. For you are his personal concern. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Every week as I prepare sermons, I, I have a little section. I, I have like a template that I kind of use to, to put my notes together. Uh, and every, <laughs> every week there is this, this section, this, this question for myself right after the scripture passage. Is review necessary? And, and I p- typically put that there because we're in, maybe we're in a series and maybe we have to hey, just a quick catch up of where we are. And so today, I, I found myself chuckling, is review necessary? Let's talk about the last two months for a minute, shall we? Do we need to review that together? Do we need to look at the way that things have gone over the past two months? Right? It's, it's been two months. Two months since the schools closed. Two months since our events were, lifted, were, were limited to less than 250 people. Then we had the closure of gyms and theaters, limits on restaurants. Then all of a sudden events could only be 50 people. And salons were closed. And then we had a stay-at-home order. Right? And then, then we closed schools for the rest of the year. And now we are in a time where our stay-at-home order is at least going until May 28th. Now, that's just the facts of the things that have been going on. But with all of this going on, we cannot deny the fact that there is a palpable amount of concern in the air with regards to COVID-19, with regards to our government, with regards to all that is going on in our lives. Right? Some are concerned about overreaction. Others are concerned about not taking enough action. Some are concerned about too much power in the government. Others are concerned that the the government will cave to pressure. Some are concerned about their businesses and their livelihoods. Others are concerned that their business or their livelihood might get them sick and others around them. Some are concerned because they know too much about this. Others are concerned because they don't know enough. And still others are concerned because they don't know what they know or who to listen to or where all of this information is coming from. Some are concerned about what may be forced upon us because of this virus. Others are concerned that some may resist the results or the fixes that come to be. And so today, we look at 1 Peter chapter 5, where he says, cast all of your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Now, it's important when we open Scripture, we have to set it in the context that Scripture is written in, because the, scripture of con- or the context of Scripture is not our context, it's the context in which Peter is writing. So Peter is writing to a scattered church that is living in an increasingly hostile political environment as it pertains to the faith of Jesus Christ and the practice of that faith. The Romans viewed the early Christians as obnoxious, antisocial nuisances that were secretive and cannibalistic. Hopefully we don't feel that way. But that's how they were viewed. And so as they continued to practice their faith, they continued to draw the ire of the local authorities. Being a Christ follower in that day meant the impending possibility of persecution. It could break out at any time. No one knew what was going to happen. And it did eventually with the emperor Nero persecuting all of the Christians throughout the Roman Empire. Actually, in that time, your door's right there. There In that time, really, honestly, if we think hard about this, there was no time where there was a greater possibility that all of Christianity could be wiped out by the Roman government. Obviously, that didn't happen because God is on the throne and He takes care of His people. We have to recognize then, because of this environment that Peter is writing into, that these Christians, 
Many of them new converts who are just beginning to grapple with the realities of what the apostles are teaching at this time were concerned. They were concerned for their lives. You can imagine that they probably had some conversations like, man, if this political environment gets any worse, I can't imagine what it's going to be like. They were concerned for their children or their grandchildren, the ones that they had, or whether or not they should even bring children or grandchildren into, or bring children into this world at that time, right? They were concerned about families, or maybe, maybe they were engaged and wondering, should I even get married at this point? Or maybe they were single and saying, how am I ever going to find someone in this environment? It's terrible. It's awful. No one, right? Who's going who's gonna to be looking for this? They're concerned about their businesses. What if the government came in and closed me down and took my livelihood? They were concerned about their future because it was increasingly unknown to them. Sound familiar? Not much has changed in the last 2,000 years, huh? You know, the reality for us is that we have only added our, to our previous lists of concerns and anxieties that were already abundant in our lives. They were already uh, things that we worry about on a regular basis. We worried about being in crowds, or maybe we worry about being alone. We worry about being up too high, or maybe we worried about being in enclosed spaces. We worry about failure, or maybe we worry about the implications of what success would bring. We worry about flying, or we worry about driving. We worry about knowing God's will for our lives. Or we worry that we have or will miss that will. Maybe you've you've heard the joke. It it actually comes from a play, and it, it, it gets me every time. But if olive oil comes from olives, and if peanut oil comes from peanuts, then where does baby oil come from? Right? It seems somewhat ridiculous, and yet it's it kind of gets at the deep reality of how far we can go with our concerns, with our anxieties, with our worries. It is no stretch to say for us today that anxiety pervades our lives at epidemic levels. You may feel it in different ways, but it is there. So, what is anxiety? What What are the concerns that... Peter is talking about here. Well, the word anxiety uh, comes from a, a couple of different root words depending on where you want to go with your, uh, your sort of word study uh, thoughts. It comes from one root word in the, la- in the Latin which actually means to choke or to strangle. This is not an unfamiliar feeling when we are gripped with anxiety and we just don't know what to do. Sometimes it feels like we can't even breathe. We can't even move. We just, we're we're paralyzed. Another part of this word comes from a root that means to divide or to distract. But no matter where you want to go with that, the reality is that anxiety fuels the fear of our lives and renders us in many ways uh, inactive, perhaps, or overactive, depending on how we respond to it. It renders us to be less productive than maybe we should be, less focused than we should be. It takes our minds and twists it all around in our lives so that we don't know which way is up. Right? It's hard to live your life when you're always afraid of death. It's hard to succeed when you're always fearing failure. There's so much in so many ways that we can, we can say these things. Before we move on, I, I do want to acknowledge this morning that for many of us, this is a constant battle. And, and whether it's by force of habit or a medical condition, anxiety is a constant life companion. And we fight it day in and day out. And I want us to recognize this morning that neither God nor Scripture nor even myself want to deny that, want to 
say it isn't real or am in any way unsympathetic to this or have no experience with it as well. What Peter says here and what he is doing in this moment is answering the question, how do we handle anxiety? How do we handle anxiety? Cast all of your cares upon Him because He cares for you. Recognize really quickly what the Bible doesn't say there. The Bible does not say to deny your anxiety. It doesn't say to repress your anxiety. It doesn't say to distract yourself from anxiety. It doesn't say to ignore anxiety. It doesn't say to run away from anxiety. It doesn't matter how irrational or illogical your anxiety may seem. It is real. It's real for you. And for us to deny that in other people, or even in ourselves, is almost like denying the human condition in many ways. Anxiety is a very real thing. And the Bible does not deny the presence of anxiety. It actually acknowledges it. It's part of our lives. It's a reality that we all face. The Bible says, here is how. How to handle anxiety. And so, Peter uses a word, an action word. He says to cast, cast all of your anxieties on Jesus. It literally means to hand it over, to place it upon, to throw it upon. Right? Not cast in the fishing sense where we cast something out and then reel it back in. It's not the casting out that you do when you're annoyed with your animals and say, hey, go away only to receive them back a few minutes later with your full loving affection. He literally says, throw all of your anxieties on the Lord. Right? Like this rock. I'm supposed to have this, right? To throw. Throw your anxieties upon the Lord. Get rid of it. Like a garbage man, right? We have these new garbage trucks. They have the little claw and they just dump it, right? But it used to be, it used to be that there was a, a garbage man, a, a garbage thrower, and he rode either in the, the passenger seat or in the back of the truck, right? And what did he do? What did he do? He came and he got your trash and he, rah, throws it onto the truck, right? He doesn't pick out little pieces at a time and, you know, keep running back and forth, whatever. He takes the whole bag and rah, throws it right in there. It gets crushed up and, and whatever else. That's the the idea that Peter is getting at. Throw, cast, get rid of all of your anxieties. And where do you put it? Put it on the Lord. Why? Because He cares for you. Or in the paraphrase, because you are His personal concern. Now, we read this in the NIV as a command, right? Verse 6 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And then it says, cast all of your anxieties. But if we want to read this literally from the Greek, it's actually a participle. That's exciting, right? Everybody loves a good grammar lesson. But it's important. It's important in this, in this uh, section to, to, rea- to realize what Peter is saying and how he's saying it. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord, casting your anxieties upon him. And he will lift you up in due time because he cares for you. This is really the reality of what's getting on. It's not enough to just say, throw your anxieties, right? Because it's just that easy. (laughs) It's not. It's not just that easy. And and, and the reality of, of how we cast them, how we throw them, how we lay them upon the Lord is by humbling ourselves. It comes back to humility. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Following Christ's example, he who humbled himself by being obedient unto death, even death on a cross, right? Humble yourselves before the Lord, casting all your cares upon him. What does this look like? What does this look like? Because humility is is a big word that we talk about a lot, but maybe we need to vet it just a little bit. Think about flying on a plane for a second. When you get on a plane, you you participate 
in a humbling of yourself. Because you are recognizing that at that moment, you do not have control of the plane. You do not have the know-how to fly the plane. You do not have any ability to handle your situation apart from sitting back and doing what the pilot says. Sit back, relax, and enjoy your flight, right? And it doesn't matter if you're sitting in first class or if you're sitting in the last row next to the toilets. There's nothing you can do. You are humbling yourself and allowing the pilot to do what the pilot does. And it doesn't matter how much you worry about things in the flight, right? You can be sitting back in row, you know, 30B and and wondering why the flaps are down. Why are the flaps up? What was that turbulence? Oh my goodness gracious, am I ever going to get a drink? Right? You worry and worry and worry. Where are we right now? I have no idea. And and, and so what do you do? (laughs) You ask the person in seat 22A, hey, how's this flight going? Maybe they read a book on planes one time and they say, ah, it seems great. But the reality is that they don't actually have any more control of the flight than we do. We have to admit that we are out of our league. We have to admit that this is beyond our control. And we have to submit, humble ourselves to the pilot's ability. Because he's the only one flying the plane. He, she is the only one flying the plane. They're the only one that know how to do it too. Now, (laughs) we have to humble ourselves before the Lord and recognize who God is and who we are. And we have to recognize who is actually in control here. We think so often that we can control our lives, that we have everything in our own grip, right? How many of us, (laughs) how many of us want to have control of our lives? Yeah? Okay. Right? We want to have control. We want to feel like we're in control. And if nothing else in the last two months, we have been faced with the simple reality that we are not in control. We're not. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you think about the virus. It doesn't matter what you think about the government. It doesn't matter what you think about any of this. The simple reality is that we have been faced in our North American self-centered lives that we are not in control here right if i were to tell you in january that this was all going to happen you probably would have laughed at me if i were to say right now we all want to go back to february when everything seemed all hunky-dory why would we want to go back there because it felt normal because we were in control humble yourselves before the lord's mighty hand casting all of your anxieties on him We read Scripture upon Scripture that talks about who God is and about what He does in our lives, right? I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, right? He he will not let your foot slip. He who neither slumbers nor sleeps will watch over you day and night. He, He will never leave you or forsake you, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He is the one that makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He is the one who restores my soul. We read these things. We know these things. And yet we don't, seem to want to live them. But the reality is is that they are the truth that we need in this moment. If we are going to cast our anxieties on anyone, we need to cast our anxieties on the one who has written every single day of our lives in his book before any single one of them came to be. The one who knit us together in our mother's wombs. The one who knows us better than we know ourselves. That's the person that should be in control of our lives. That's the one who should be managing things that's the pilot that we want right we don't need to get up in the early in the morning to give god a wake-up call because he's already been awake he never slumbers nor sleeps we don't need to stay up at night working harder and harder and harder because god went to bed early he neither slumbers 
nor sleeps. Right? God knows. He knows about your kids, about your family, about your business, about your future. He wrote them. He designed them. He ordained them to be. Right? We so readily quote Psalm 139. Right? I knit you together in my mother's womb. I, I praise you because I am fearfully, wonder, wonderfully made. What do we quote this for? We quote this when we talk about things like abortion. And rightly so. But why is it that we so poorly apply the very same passage to our own lives? Because if we're honest with ourselves, we want to be in control. And we wrestle and struggle greatly with being out of control. We are like the disciples <laughs> in the boat in the storm, right? They're trying to hold on to everything and da-da-da-da-da. They got the creator of the world sleeping, <laughs> right? The one who is omniscient, knows everything. The one who can literally like holds all the world and all the, the world, all the universe in his hands and he's sleeping in the boat and they wake him up and they say, Jesus, 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 I just want you to know you're about to drown. It's, it's kind of ridiculous if you think about it. Hey, by the way, God, just want to know you're about to, you're about to drown there. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to wonder, like, like, Jesus, you know, being woken up from a nap going, uh, man, I wish these guys would get it. <laughs> we feel like that in our lives sometimes. When we get to the point of being out of control, where we say, Jesus, Jesus, hey, wake up. And he goes, whoa. I've actually been here the whole time. The reality is that for us, we follow very readily in the footsteps of Adam and Eve who want to be like God. We want to have control. He knows. He knows where you are. He knows where you've been. He he discerns your laying down and your rising. No matter where you go, no matter where you are, He is there. He's not sleeping. He's not distracted. He's not on vacation. He hasn't left you. Right? When you're wondering how you're going to make ends meet, the provider of every good and perfect gift is there. When you're awake at 3 a.m. trying to shut your mind off, He is there offering his peace. When you don't think you can make it to tomorrow, the one who sustains the universe is at your side. When we're facing grief and despair, the great comforter has his hand on your shoulder. When we're facing death in all of its awful forms, in any of its awful forms, he is there. Because nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not height, nor depth, nor any of the other things that we worry about in our lives. Neither life nor death can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And, and so we... <laughs> And so we read anew again, right? I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come, come, come from? Not from the hills, but from the Lord, the one who made the heavens and the earth. We read anew again Psalm 23. The oh Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Maybe we need to read anew again Matthew 6. It says, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Right? Are you not more valuable than a couple of sparrows? Yes. Peter says, cast your anxieties on him. The whole weight of your anxieties on him. Why? Because you are his personal concern. So why is this important? Well, I don't need to reread the litany of things that have gone, in our gone on in our lives in the past two months that have wrested control from our lives and, and, and taken it away, it feels like. 
I don't need to probably tell you too much about how people are concerned about their jobs, about their lives, about their health, whatever. But the reality is, and, and, and Peter says this as he moves on from this section, he says, why is this concern? Why do you need to cast your anxieties on him? Because we need to be alert. Because the enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. When we hold our anxieties, some, some of us actually keep our anxieties and our concerns like pets. We want to have them around. Some of us actually worry about not having enough to worry about. <laughs> And when we do that, we are trying to take control back from God. And in doing so, we are participating in the sin of pride. We are participating in, <laughs> in the sin of selfishness. We are pretending that we have more knowledge about our situation than God does. And it's that moment that the devil pounces on us and seeks to devour us. Cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. You are His personal concern. You know, the reality is that the future, this is, this is hard to, right, I, I say this, reading Scripture, recognizing that this is insanely difficult at times to remember. And it is really hard to apply to our lives. I wish it was as easy as saying, hey, cast your cares on Jesus. And then, we cast our cares in Jesus, and then everything's fine. But you and I know both very well that it, it isn't always that easy. And so we need to remind ourselves the truths of Scripture. There are 365, I think. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I read this on Google, so if it's wrong, I'm sorry. There are 365 times in the Bible where God shows up and says, Hey, do not be afraid. Do not fear. 365 of them. 365 times, once a, enough for once a day, where we could read in the Bible that God shows up and says, do not be afraid. And maybe that's exactly what needs to happen for us. You know, the future is coming at us at a rate of 60 seconds a minute. 60 minutes an hour, 24 hours a day. 7 days a week, 365 days a year. And it might be for us that for us to cast our anxieties on Jesus, to put the full weight of the anxieties on him, that we need to second by second remind ourselves of who God is and who we are. To lift our eyes to the hills, as it were, and remember that our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We take it one step at a time. We take it one minute at a time. One day at a time. And are reminded of the one who came to this earth to ensure that our salvation and our lives were secure and are secure forevermore in the hand of God. Now before we close this morning, I want to acknowledge one thing. Today is... The Sunday after Mother's Day, and for us as a church, whether, whether you are uh, a guest with us this morning or, or whether you're, you're, you've been a member here all your life, uh, typically this Sunday would be Youth Sunday. And we would recognize the great things that have gone on in youth group, and there are many. And we would recognize the seniors in our congregation, and there are many. And we would talk about what they're going to do and where they're going to be and all these things. And then the reality for a lot of them is with school being canceled, with sports being canceled, with so much going on, it, they, it feels a little forgotten. And rest assured, we will have a Youth Sunday where we can acknowledge and, and glorify God for all the great things that He has done and continues to do in our youth groups and through our youth leaders. But I want to take a minute to just acknowledge our seniors. And remember for a minute, <laughs> I remember being a senior. I remember graduating and wondering what the heck I was going to do with my life and how that was all going to work out. And seven and a half years of college later, 
I didn't still know what I was going to do with my life. And 10 years into the whole education thing, when I got a master's degree, I still didn't know what I was going to do to my life, right? I, I still don't. I don't know. Maybe this is it. Who knows? There's something else going on. I don't know, right? It's the reality is that we don't know that God holds our future in his hand, right? But for seniors, this anxiety can be very real. I want to acknowledge them right now. And then I want us to spend a few minutes in prayer praying for ourselves and for them as well. Our seniors this year, Anna Washburn, Danielle Rooks, Ethan Gilder, George Peterson, Gracie DeZoo, Jonathan Porter, Michaeli Steffens, Michaela Stanley, Noah Hunt, Stephanie Bullhouse, Stephen Osborne, Amanda Green, Will Ruhrink, Cody Bleak, and Zina Pasteur. Just recognize for a minute that those are, some of those, a lot of those, are faces that you might not recognize. And that's awesome. Because God has blessed us with the ability to reach out and minister to kids, uh, to students, young adults through this community. And all of them, all of them are looking forward to something. All of them are also facing a future in which the reality of schools closed and online classes and whatever else has them perhaps guessing or second guessing what is going on. But the words of Peter here, humble yourselves before God's mighty hand, casting your cares upon him, and he will lift you up in due time. Because he cares for you. You are his personal concern ring true in their lives as well as ours. And become just the forefront of what we hold as, as a Reformed church as the first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism. And maybe this is what we re- need to remind ourselves of each day too. What is my only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. He has set me free from the power and the tyranny of the devil. He preserves my life in such a way that without the will of my Father in heaven, not even a hair can fall from my head. Not even a hair, right? Something so seemingly ridiculous. Not even a hair can fall from my head without it being the will of my Father in heaven. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing, ready, and able to follow and serve him from this time forward and forevermore. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Lord, before even a single atom of this universe was formed, you were there. And you have written every moment of every day that the universe will exist in your book. And Lord, we confess right now that sometimes we struggle to believe that. We struggle to let control of our own lives go to you. We struggle with anxiety and fear. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would give us the strength, that you would give us the courage, that you would give us the conviction that we need to cast our cares on you, to let them go and let you control our lives. Father, we don't do humility well. But Lord, you know, you know us completely, fully. And so Father, we lay ourselves before you and we lay our burdens upon you. And we thank you. You don't have to care for us. You choose to care for us because you love us. God, we couldn't be more thankful. Father, for these seniors that are graduating this year. Lord, in these difficult and strange times, we lift them before you and we ask that you would 
uh, you would raise them up. Wherever they are going, whatever you have in store for them, Lord, give them the calm assurance that you are with them every step of the way, that you will not leave them, that you will not forsake them. And Father, may we as a church continue to support them. That wherever they go, whether it's away or here, that they may find a community of faith to be plugged into, that they may have people who can who walk with them, continue to disciple them, to hold them accountable. Lord, to continually remind them and point them to your son, Jesus. Father, we don't know what's going to come in the next few minutes. We don't know what's going to come this week. But Lord, we know that you go with us. That you go before us. That you hem us in on every side. And so, Father, we pray today that we would be constantly and consistently reminded of your presence. Holy Spirit, fill us, renew us, strengthen us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. <laughs> Just a couple of quick housekeeping things before, uh, before we go. Um, if you have food for the food pantry... Uh, you can swing around here and, and drop them off underneath the, the canopy here um, and, and giving as well. Uh, just a reminder, if, if you uh, want to give, uh, you can give online too. We have all that stuff on our website, uh, hopkinscommunitychurch.net slash giving. Um, also, um, just if, you, if you're online right now and you're, you're watching the live stream, the church will be open tomorrow from 9 until 9. And if you have food that you want to bring, you can bring it there and leave it inside the doors and we will make sure that it gets where it needs to go. The same is true if you have a check. You can also mail stuff. It's, it's all good. Maybe not mail food. That probably wouldn't be a good idea. Um, yeah. I, I encourage you, actually implore you if, you, if you will, to pray for the consistory. We are meeting tomorrow night and one of the big things that we are going to be uh, talking about is what does reopening look like if it looks like anything right now. Um, and I know that there are a lot of opinions. I thank you. There, there's a survey. Uh, you can take that survey um, online. Uh, we're just, we want to do what's right for, for us and for the community and for our ministry and mission. Um, and that, I, it's a difficult conversation because we don't know. We really are seeking your prayers as we seek to discern what God has, is calling for us to do uh, in this moment and in this time. So that we can best share Jesus with the community of Hopkins uh, with, and, and continue to uh, be uh, the church here as well. We don't know what the week is going to hold. But we know that God goes with us. And so know that, the great, uh, know that the Word of God dwells in you richly. And know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the, the fellowship, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit, the one who raised Jesus from the dead, is with you now and always. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still. Pray.
shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Sing it out, sing, oh, praise. great week and go in peace.
Uh-huh.